Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar in the CERDOP and ESCCP webinar series. My name is Ruth Adib. I'm a senior principal at Geosyntax Consultants in California and the coordinator of the webinar series on behalf of CERDOP and ESCCP. It is my pleasure to facilitate today's call. The webinar will consist of a brief overview of CERDOP and ESCCP followed by technical content which details results from Department of Defense funded research on developing more environmentally friendly and better performing coding systems to protect military equipment. Dr. Eric Yedzi from the Naval Research Laboratory will share the results of his research on demonstrating and validating the performance of single and two component polysiloxane top coats. These types of top coats are safer for the environment and could streamline logistics for equipment maintenance, uh, ultimately resulting in cost savings and increased productivity for the Department of Defense. A Q&A session will be held at the end of uh, Eric's presentation. On this slide, we have provided a few suggestions in case you experience difficulties with the broadcast platform. Firefox, IE, or Edge are the most compatible browsers to use with Zoom. If you lose the content on your screen or if your screen freezes, try keying Control F5 to perform a hard refresh. If you are accessing the audio through your computer, click the arrow next to the Join Audio button, select Test Speaker and Microphone, and then follow the prompt as they appear on your screen. You may also submit a comment using the chat box. Please use that chat box only for comments related to technical difficulties. The Q&A option should be reserved for questions for today's speaker. Today's broadcast will be listen only. You may submit questions by using the Q&A box on your screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A period to submit your questions. We do encourage you to submit questions well in advance of that session. When you submit your question, please make sure you add your organization name at the end of your question so that we can identify you during the Q&A. With that, I would like to introduce Dr. Robin Nissan, who is the startup and ESCCP program manager for weapons, systems, and platforms. Before joining uh, CERDAP and ESCCP, Robin worked at Navair's Weapons Division, China Lake in California. Robin? Thank you very much, Rua. I'm very happy to welcome everyone to today's CERDAP and ESCCP uh, webinar. Uh, CERDAP on slide nine is the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program. It was established in 1991 by Congress and is a partnership between the DOD, Department of Energy, and EPA. CERDIP's mission is to identify and address high priority environmental science and technology opportunities which focus on DOD requirements. CERDIP funds both fundamental research as well as advanced technology development that ultimately impacts real world environmental management. On slide 10, ESTCP is the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program. In this program, we demonstrate innovative environmental and energy technologies. These investments capitalize on past investments under CERDIP or other research programs and are designed to transition technologies out of the lab and into the field. Especially important in all ESTCP demonstrations is the ultimate transition to implementation and regulatory acceptance. On slide, oh, uh, CERDIP and ESTCP are complementary programs. So much of the research occurring in the lab and pilot scale um, in CERDIP uh, with occasional field efforts, while in ESTCP demonstrations are primarily at the pilot and field scale, although occasionally supporting lab efforts are conducted. On slide 11, there are four program areas in CERDIP and five in ESTCP. The Installation, Energy, and Water Program area is only ESTCP, while the other four, Environmental Restoration, Munitions Response, Resource Conservation and Resiliency, and Weapon Systems and Platforms are CERDIP and ESTCP programs managed jointly by a designated uh, program manager. 
slide 12. Our webinar today focuses on research and demonstration that was conducted under the Weapon Systems and Platforms area. Uh, this program area essentially has five major focus areas, uh, including surface engineering, structural materials, energetic materials and munitions, noise and emissions, waste reduction and treatment, and lead-free electronics. On slide 13, uh, some of our upcoming webinar uh, series are highlighted, and they come from all of our five program areas. As you can see, the upcoming webinars will cover a broad range of topics, including infrastructure adaptation strategies to mitigate climate change and uncertainty, tools for modeling and mitigate, mitigation of vapor intrusion at sites impacted by chlorinated solvents, understanding underwater munitions mobility and behavior on the beach and in shallow, muddy environments. And uh, the next uh, WP webinar coming up in September uh, deals with uh, tools for uh, sustainment and health with a focus on life cycle assessment and developmental environmental safety and occupational health evaluation. So a lot coming up in the future on slide 14. Um, you can find more information about our upcoming webinars by using the link here. Uh, registration for uh, these webinars is live uh, through the end of the calendar year, and uh, a copy of, the, of today's presentation uh, and session can be downloaded from the webinar page. Uh, we would appreciate if you would take the time at the end of the webcast uh, to complete a survey that will be a pop-up on your screen. And finally, uh, before I pass it back to Rua, I'm really pleased to announce that the uh, Certipan ESDCP Symposium will again be held uh, the week after Thanksgiving. So this year will be December 3rd through 5th in Washington, DC. Uh, the three-day event will showcase the latest technologies that enhance DOD's mission through improved environmental and energy performance. Registration is available on the Certipan ESDCP website. Thank you for joining us today, and back to Rula. Thank you so much, Robin. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Eric Yetzi. Eric is a fish chemist at the U.S. Naval Research Lab in Washington, D.C. His current areas of research focus on the synthesis, synthesis of organosilicon molecules, the formulation and application of thermosetting and ultraviolet suitable coatings, understanding coating surface interactions with liquids, mechanisms of coating degradation due to weathering and corrosion, mechanical processing of coatings. Eric has numerous patents and peer-reviewed publications, and several of his technologies are being licensed for commercialization. He earned a bachelor's degree in chemistry and a doctoral degree in organic chemistry. He also served as an NIH Postdoc Fellow at the University of Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. Eric, please proceed. Okay, thank you, Rola, and uh, thank you, Robin, for funding this project, and also to uh, the ESCCP for funding the project. Okay, so on slide 17, um, this is the agenda. So today what we're going to talk about is um, just a brief overview on polyurethane top coats and some of the issues. We will then go into organosilicon polymers and the polysiloxane top coats thereof. This will be followed by uh, a slide or two about the toxicity of uh, organosilane polymer versus uh, isocyanates. We'll then follow with benefits to the DOD, testing to DOD performance requirements, um, some of the demonstrations that we're currently conducting under this ESTCP program, and then we'll follow up with conclusions. Okay, slide 18. Okay, so a brief overview about polyurethanes. Um, for those who, who may be new to this area, um, polyurethane top coats are found on the exterior of DOD aircraft and ground support equipment, and this is both for the Navy, the Marine Corps, and the Air Force. These polyurethane uh, materials are two-component systems, meaning that they're composed of one component which contains hydroxyl functional chemicals, and a second component which contains isocyanate functional chemicals. These two components are then mixed together in a very specific ratio, um, which as I state here on the slide, they have to be metered at a very specific ratio in order to obtain 
the preferred performance products once the, once the coating has cured. Now, the issue with polyurethanes is that they contain hazardous uh, and air polluting chemicals. Specifically, isocyanates can cause ear, skin irritation, um, eye irritation, uh, tightness of chest, symptoms of asthma, sensitization, and, and even death. Um, if anyone who's not familiar with sensitization, uh, that occurs when someone has already been exposed to isocyanates, and then during a subsequent exposure, someone can have a severe asthma attack, even uh, upon exposure to a very small or very low level of, of isocyanates. Um, in addition to containing isocyanates, these polyurethanes typically contain HAPS chemicals. HAPS are, are usually uh, the, the types of solvents that are used, and that can be anything from benzenes or xylenes uh, types, of types of solvents. And these solvents are potentially uh, carcinogenic. And in addition, um, uh, the polyurethanes usually contain um, higher levels of VOCs. Um, uh, typically, the these coatings are about 420 grams per liter VOCs, or about 3.5 pounds per gallon, and uh, VOCs contaminate the, the, the breathing air um, around us. So the big thing to note, aside from containing isocyanates and other hazardous chemicals, is that these polyurethanes are um, currently qualified for use on Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps uh, um, assets, and they do meet the, a variety of performance specifications. Okay, uh, slide 19. So the objective of this ESTCC, ESTCP project is to demonstrate environmentally friendly, high performance polysiloxane top coats on both aircraft and ground support equipment. Um, while the demonst demonstrations are being performed in the field, we plan to validate the operational performance compared to these qualified polyurethane top coats that are already applied on a variety of assets. Uh, in addition, uh, what we plan to do is to verify that the top coats provide a reduced environmental impact, and we plan to do this two ways. One, um, we will be collecting air samples uh, during applications of the polysiloxane top coats to show that they do not contain isocyanate-based materials, um, while at the same time when polyurethanes apl are applied, we can collect uh, airborne samples uh, showing that they contain isocyanates. And the, the bottom right-hand picture um, for everyone, this is an individual who's wearing uh, one of those uh, air, uh, air monitoring kits uh, that's sampling for isocyanates, um, specifically when they're, when they're spraying. The other way uh, that we plan to um, validate that the, they provide a reduced environmental impact is by simply calculating the amount of VOCs that are released when polysiloxanes are, are applied versus when equivalent amounts of uh, polyurethane top coats are applied. Okay, slide 20. Okay, so the, the first uh, top coat technology that I'll discuss is a, uh, is a, a Naval Research Laboratory developed single component polysiloxane top coat. Um, this top coat is based on um, alkoxy silane functional substituted urea polymers. So it's a hybrid polymer that contains organic and inorganic components. The way that this coating crosslinks is that these terminal alkoxy silane groups react with moisture, they hydrolyze, and then the, the silanol groups condense to form a sol gel or, or somewhat of a polysiloxane linkage, uh, as is shown um, on, on the right side of the arrow. What makes these polymers unique, um, obviously one, that they're single component, um, but that they are free of isocyanates and uh, um, HAP uh, solvents. The VOCs are less than, the VOCs of the top coat, that is, uh, is less than 300 grams per liter. Uh, again, contrasting that to about 420 20 grams per liter for the qualified two component polyurethanes. Uh, and also, they, these uh, single component polysiloxane top coats have a flash point greater than 100F. Um, once again, I mentioned single component, which we just, uh, the acronym is just 1K. Um, these are unique because they're an all in one can system. And so they're very similar to, uh, not, not necessarily similar to the technology and the chemistry that's found in wall paint, but similar in the sense that it is all in one can. And so, you can essentially just has, has to be uh, shaken, you open up the can, applicator pours it into a spray gun, he sprays uh, an asset and atmospheric moisture is used to cross-link the coating um, and provide uh, your properties. Um, 
once the material is decanted from the can, that can can be resealed and used for, uh, for future use. Okay, slide 21. Okay, so the second technology uh, that'll be discussed in this presentation is a two component polysiloxane top coat. Um, so one of the main components that we use in this top coat is an epoxy functional polysiloxane polymer, um, as I'm showing here in, in this example. Um, because this coating here is a two component system, you would have a reaction that occurs between the epoxy functional material shown on the slide and an amine functional material, which, which I'm just not showing on the slide, but that would be a two component system. Um, again, this system is isocyanate and HAPS free. Um, for this type of system, we can generate uh, uh, coatings with very low uh, VOC. So here it's less than 70 grams per liter of total solvent. Um, and one of the other unique attributes of this coating um, that we thought uh, we wanted to mention was that um, because these coatings provide very high flexibility, we wanted to contrast that with a lot of the commercial two components polysiloxanes, which are based on small molecule amino alkoxy silanes um, and thereby don't provide uh, very high flexibility. Okay, slide 22. Okay, so I'm um, getting into a little bit of the uh, uh, toxicity testing. Um, I'm just going to show a slide on the organosilane polymer, which is used in the single component top coat. So for this test, what we did is we had acute nose only inhalation toxicity performed um, on this polymer. And the way this test was conducted is that essentially they performed the test at a concentration of about two milligrams per liter of the polymer. Um, they expose 10 rodents to this solution um, for uh, a period of four hours. So it's a constant uh, aerosolized solution for a period of four hours. And then afterwards, they monitor the rodents um, from the time, uh, from after that four hour period, the whole way through a 14 day uh, period. After that, that's followed by terminal necropsy. And then um, they, they uh, provide, um, then there's a report on, you know, what they see. Um, um, based on the appearance of the rodents. So the main takeaway from this is that um, what really what we want to determine from performing the test is what is the LC50 value of this organosamine polymer? And the LC50 value, value is what is the lethal concentration that is required to kill 50% of the population? So from the organosamine polymer when it is exposed to the rodents is that at that concentration, which was specifically uh, 2020 milligrams per meter cubed, all the rodents survive. So there were uh, essentially any issues aside from maybe minor sweating of some of the rodents and a little bit of redness of their skin. However, to contrast that, um, the isocyanates that are used in the polyurethane top coats, um, HDI, which is hexamethylene diisocyanate, that has a LC50 value of 124 milligrams per meter cubed, and HDI homopolymers have an LC50 value of 137 to 1150. And so basically what this data is showing is that um, at minimal, the organosilane polymer was less than half the inhalation toxicity of the isocyanates that are used in polyurethane top coats. And it may be even significantly more than that because we don't know what the limit is um, to where rodents will begin to, um, begin to die. It's just that this specific test is performed at a at a only a four hour period and at two milligrams per liter. Okay, slide twenty three. Okay, so what are some of the benefits of these polysiloxane top kits to the DoD? Well, one, they would be isocyanate free, so this would allow for reduced health re health related costs in addition to reducing costs that are attributed to um, uh, airborne monitoring and also laboratory testing to, to test for those isocyanates. Um, the technology will allow for concurrent maintenance in nearby areas during paint applications. And um, specifically, one of the areas where this would be extremely helpful would be when sailors are performing touch-up and repair on ships. Um, currently, uh, when, they, when they paint with polyurethanes on ships, they're supposed, they're supposed to evacuate the entire hangar bays. All the doors of the bays are supposed to be open. The aircraft are supposed to be roped off so that no one was allowed in that area. Um, and they try to really contain uh, the exposure of, of anyone to isocyanates. So by having an isocyanate-free top coat, 
they would actually be able to perform uh, maintenance in nearby areas without having to worry about exposure to these harmful chemicals. Uh, in addition, uh, because the polysiloxane top coats are lower in VOCs, this would allow um, artisans at depots to be able to paint more often, so it would increase productivity uh, by allowing higher throughput uh, of equipment and aircraft. Um, the single component, because it is an all-in-one can system, um, reduces the generation of hazardous waste compared to two component polyurethanes. As I said, as a single component system, you only have to use what you pour out of the can. So as long as you reseal the can or the can hasn't been exposed to a, a significant amount of, of uh, moisture or, or water being poured into the can, um, it will last for um, you know, several weeks, um, even potentially months. So to contrast this um, with two component materials, once those components are mixed, you have a defined pot life and all of that ha material has to be used Otherwise, um, you have to discard that material as hazardous waste. And then finally, um, by having a, a polysiloxane top coat that is free of these isocyanates and, and HAP materials, um, is that uh, we have shown um, in laboratory testing that these, these top coats are also compatible with chromate free primers. And so this allows the DoD to potentially have a completely non hazardous coating system. Um, so whether it's uh, you know aluminum rich primers or lithium rich or magnesium rich, um, there is a, a very high potential here to have a completely non-hazardous uh, um, coating system. Okay, slide 24. Okay, so now I'm going to get into a little bit of the performance testing um, that we have uh, that we have conducted during this program. So. Um, a lot of the tests that I'm, I'm showing here, these were conduct, conducted by the Naval Air Warfare Center in, in uh, Patuxent River, Maryland. And so the, all these tests that I have listed here in the table, uh, these are a lot of the tests that are found under MILPERP 85285. Now, the single component top coat, um, this was tested to type four requirements, which are requirements for aircraft. Whereas the uh, two component polysiloxane top coat was tested to type two requirements, which is uh, designed for ground support equipment. Essentially, um, the only real difference between the two different types is that um, type four requirements, um, as I said, which are geared towards aircraft, they have a, a much more stringent um, weatherability requirement. So that, that requirement is about 3,000 hours at uh, 3,000 hours of xenon arc weatherability, uh, and you must have a delta E of one or less, so a color change of one or less. Whereas for type two, for ground support equipment, um, you only have to have a, a delta E of, of less than one after 500 hours. So all these tests you can see here in the table, um, whether it's solvent resistance or fluid resistance or uh, 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 impact, um, heat resistance, cleanability, and so on, um, these were all tests that the polysiloxane top coats have been tested to, and the, the, the polysiloxane top coats are able to meet all of these requirements. Okay, slide 25. Okay, uh, another um, unique attribute of the polysiloxane top coat, at least of the single component polysiloxane top coat that um, is, is worth noting, is that um, it does have a, a faster dry time than the two component polyurethanes. And the reason why this is important is that um, specifically when you're painting uh, aircraft such as helicopters that have a lot of protrusions on them and the artisans have to delicately move around the aircraft and they're crawling under the aircraft and, and so on, is that um, they've noted that the single component top coat is, is more forgiving uh, because it cures faster. So uh, in areas where they're, when they're moving around and painting and they're accidentally brushing up against the, the polysiloxane, they're not having paint transfer to their uh, to their PPE, whereas they do notice this notice that this happens oftentimes with the two component polyurethanes. And when this happens, then later on they have to go back and, and perform um, touch and, re and repair on those areas. Whereas right now they're not having to do that when they apply the single component polysiloxane. Okay, slide 26. Okay, so here's a table. Um, this table is just showing a small subset of tests that uh, were, was performed at the, uh, the uh, Air Force Research Laboratory at, at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Um, 
the Air Force performs their tests slightly different than the Navy. Um, for the Air Force, they perform everything as a complete system, whereas the Navy uh, does very similar testing. The majority of the tests are performed as a system. However, the flexibility uh, is tested, um, uh, the flexibility of the top coat is tested just by itself. So the results here that I'm showing from the Air Force, um, this is a comparison of the single component camouflage gray polysiloxane top coat versus a type four two component camouflage gray polyurethane. Um, both of these tests were conducted over a magnesium rich epoxy primer with a pre-coat pretreatment. And so you can see um, from, from this subset of results, the poly, uh, polysiloxane system is able to pass fluid resistance, um, low temperature flexibility, GE impact before and after 3,000 hours of weathering, and, um, uh, and also retains very good uh, weather resistance. However, we do see issues with the polyurethane um, over this magnesium rich primer. And that can be um, failure, some of the fluid resistance tests. We're seeing failure, low temperature flexibility, which I'll, I'll show on the next slide, and also um, failure after uh, the 3,000 hours of weathering. Slide 27. Okay, so this here, these are pictures of the, the low temperature flexibility test of both the polysiloxane and polyurethane top coats over a magnesium rich primer and the traditional chromated epoxy primer. The picture to your far left, um, this is showing the, the polysiloxane primer over that, or the polysiloxane top coat over the magnesium rich primer, showing that when that system is bent, is there absolutely no cracks that form within that system. And this, again, this is a low temperature flexibility at about minus 60 F. Um, however, uh, the polyurethane over the magnesium rich primer, there's very small cracks that form, um, so that is a failure. I know it's hard, to, it's difficult to see from the slides, but the, there are some very small cracks in the photograph. Um, the polysiloxane, um, when that was tested over the chromate primer, there were some small cracks that formed there also. However, with the polyurethane over the chromate primer is that we see a, a, a extensive cracks forming. And by the picture to the far left, you can see is that the coating system uh, cracked uh, completely across the panel. It's slide 28. Okay, um, one of the other tests that we had performed, uh, and this was work performed by the Air Force, uh, is that we had 18 months of beach exposure um, conducted to uh, do a comparison of the corrosion resistance of the single component top coat versus the, the two component polyurethane top coat. Um, I'm only gonna show two slides on this work here because there's, there's a significant amount of data and it's too much to show for this talk. Um, but really what I wanna point out is that um, there really wasn't much difference between uh, the, the stack ups, the systems uh, that contain the, the polysiloxane or the polyurethane. Very subtle differences. Um, one thing to note is that there was more, more uh, corrosion shown um, um, in uh, scribe fasteners when the, the fasteners were cadmium plated steel versus titanium um, fasteners. Um, but other than that, really there wasn't much difference between either two systems. And so, so on this slide, um, these are two pictures, and again, it's, it's a very complicated formula to, to describe how the corrosion is rated. Um, so I'm just going to just give a, um, a, a bullet point on um, uh, the corrosion resistance of these systems. But uh, essentially from these photos here is that the two-component polyurethane system performs slightly better um, after that 18 months over a magnesium rich primer using cadmium plated steel fasteners when they're scribed. That's slide 29. However, um, when the same testing was performed over the chromate primer with these two different top coats, and again using cadmium plated steel fasteners that are scribed, is that the 1K polysiloxane system had slightly better corrosion resistance. Again, this, the, the difference between the two systems is only very minor. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I do want to make that known. Um, but again, um, what we're seeing is that uh, the 1K polysiloxane is performing very well, and that's really what we want to show with this program. Say okay, slide 30. Okay, so in addition to making uh, camouflage gray or essentially matte low gloss coatings, um, we, we have uh, developed semi gloss polysiloxane coatings. 
for uh, specifically for the Air Force um, and on use on their ground support equipment. And so one of the tests that we wanted to perform was um, was evaluating um, what the what the adhesion of the polysiloxane top coat would be if we had to perform uh, a touch up or repair in the field. So what this data is showing is that um, we had two different types of primers that we use over two different substrates. Uh, one of the substrates being steel, one aluminum. Uh, the steel substrate was coated with a zinc-rich primer. The aluminum substrate coated with a magnesium-rich primer. And then we applied our semi-gloss polysiloxane top, top coat over top. Um, after 14 days of system cure, then we prepared the surfaces up over those panels. And those three surface preparation consisted of either no, no zero surface preparation, essentially. Um, we had a light abrasion with sandpaper and then applied a um, an adhesion promoting uh, chemical, which is this commercially available Zipchem Surprep AP1. And then the third surface preparation was uh, abrading the surfaces with 80 to 100 grit sandpaper, wiping with isopropanol. Uh, after that, all of these surfaces were then recoated with a, another coat of the semi gloss polysiloxane. We allowed 14 days of cure to go by, and then we performed patty adhesion tests uh, over all the panels. And essentially what the, what the table is showing is that um, regardless of what type of surface preparation we used, um, even without separate surface preparation, is that we had uh, adhesion values over 2,000 um, for all the panels. Um, and um, again, there's a lot of data, so you know, I'm, uh, I'm not going to dive too deep into it, but um, areas where we did see uh, adhesion failure was either uh, an adhesive failure between the primer and the substrate, or we would see some cohesive failure uh, within the primers, but um, rarely do we see any sort of failure between the, the polysiloxane or the polysiloxane and the primer. Okay, slide 31. Okay, so um, now moving uh, closer into the, the discussion about the demonstrations, um, one of the unique attributes of the polysiloxane is the fact that because it's single component, it lends itself to um, performing touch-up or repair very easily. And so a lot, with the manufacturer, we develop these touch-up kits for field repairs. And the touch-up kits are essentially a, an eight ounce can of material that comes in a box with a pre valve spray gun, uh, a reducer, and also brushes to perform repair. Um, so it's a kit that's it's very easy to use. Um, all you essentially have to do is you, you take the, the coating, uh, reduce it down with a little bit of solvent so it's easier to spray through that pre valve gun. Um, but it's still an aerosol spray or, or brush application. Um, but the unique uniqueness about it is that the poly, uh, polysiloxane provides polyure, polyurethane performance, yet avoids the, the issue of isocyanates. Um, this type of kit uh, avoids some of the costly uh, aerosol cans that have a limited pot life once the bladder is broken. So you could spray this material, you could take off the pre -val gun, and you could save the material for a prolonged period of time come back um, and perform more touch up and repairs with it uh, at a later time. And currently this material here, this is being qualified to MILPERF 81352, which is a, a touch up spec for uh, Navy aircraft and support equipment. Slide 32. Okay, so um, taking that touch up kits, uh, so far uh, we have uh, the manufacturer has batched about 60 of these touch-up kits, and we have sent them to uh, numerous air stations uh, around the world. Um, one of the uh, one of the ones I'm going to focus on here is a as a demonstration that we performed back in August with the VFA 105 Squadron uh, at uh, Naval Air Station Oceana in Virginia, and so we provide them provided them with a few of these touch-up kits. And what they did is they went and uh, did touch up a repair on an FA-18 Hornet to the station there. Um, you know, as I said, uh, the components are mixed together. So it's just a reducer adding to the normal uh, 1K polysiloxane top coat. There's just a brief shaking. Uh, you screw on the pre -val gun and uh, you begin spraying. And so one of the comments that, they, uh, that the applicators had was that the polysiloxane top coat sprayed uh, very easily and blended well with the surrounding uh, 2K polyurethane. And those pictures um, are shown below. So you can see on the picture to your far left, um, that's a repair that needed to be done on the aircraft. 
So they, they sanded uh, that small area and provided the chromated allodyne treatment. Um, that was followed by the chromated primer, and then they applied uh, the, the, the top coat uh, with the touch-up kit uh, on top of that and, um, and were able to easily perform the, the touch-up and repair. Slide 33. Okay, so this is a list of some of the demonstrations that we have performed thus far um, with the two component gloss white polysiloxane top coat. And I'll, I'll actually touch on, uh, touch on that more uh, here on the, the next slide. Um, but we did perform a demonstration on a mid-range tow tractor at NASA Oceana. Uh, we've also uh, painted a spotting dolly, which is now deployed on the USS Nimitz. Um, the single component camouflage gray polysiloxane top coat was uh, applied on on uh, the wings and the vertical stabilizers of an F-18 uh, at NASP Thugson River. Um, we have painted um, a UH-1 Live Venom and Marine Corps Air Base New River in Jacksonville. We have painted three AH-1Z Vipers at the Marine Corps Air Base Camp Pendleton. And we have also painted two B-4 maintenance stands at McDill Air Force Base using the single component semi-gloss gray polysoxane top coat. Slide 34. Okay, so here's a, a little bit of information about the two component gloss white top coat. Uh, again, um, remember this is the coating, has about 70 grams per liter VOCs, uh, total solvent, uh, isocyanate free and HAPS free. So this was a demonstration that we conducted back in March of 2007. And the data I'm showing here, or at least the pictures I'm showing here, are from the 12 month field inspection, which was uh, performed in March of 2018. Um, this entire MRTP was painted with the two component gloss white polysiloxane, except for the doors. So the doors were painted with a the 85285 type two qualified polyurethane top coat. Um, these were then put into service, which they're used on the flight line routinely. Um, and again, uh, after one year, one year of uh, service, um, the vehicles were inspected. Um, we performed, um, you know, dry foam thickness measurements, color, gloss, uh, general corrosion inspections, and so on. And um, really the takeaway from, from um, this inspection was that um, if you look at the bottom left-hand photo, you can see that the two component polysiloxane on the cab still has a, 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 a very bright, shiny, high gloss appearance to it. Whereas the two component polyurethane on the door is uh, beginning to down gloss and isn't nearly as glossy. Um, that, uh, the, the Delta E on the, the polysiloxane was about uh, 0.48, whereas the, the Delta E, or the color change, for those who aren't familiar with this uh, uh, information, um, the, the color change on the polyurethanes was about 1.45, so almost three times greater uh, for the polyurethane. So essentially, um, the takeaway is that the two-component polysiloxane provides better color and gloss retention um, than that qualified 85285 top coat after one year of service. However, uh, the big thing is that um, lower VOCs and it is isocyanate free. Slide 35. Okay, so now um, this is one of our first demos on aircraft that we performed with our camouflage gray polysiloxane top coat. Um, this was a demo that was conducted at the uh, uh, Naval Air Station Patuxent River. Um, here we painted the vertical stabilizers and the wings of the F-18. Um, you can see in the upper left-hand photo, this is uh, the, the aircraft with the primer, and it's an 85582 Type 2 chromated primer. Um, moving, to, uh, moving to the right, these are now the artisans beginning to apply the polysiloxane top coat. The bottom left photo shows them applying the, the, the polysiloxane top coat on the wings, and the final photo is after the single component top coat has been applied. Um, this application was conducted uh, under conditions that range from the high 50s, the high 50s to the mid 60s degree Fahrenheit, and the relative humidity were anywhere from the low 20s to the um, mid to upper 20s uh, for relative humidity. Um, some of the takeaways from this are that uh, the artisans noted is that the 1K polysiloxane was more sag resistant than the 2K polyurethanes, so it was a little bit more forgiving to work with. Um, especially on areas where there was some curvature. And um, we didn't see any issues with curing of this material. Um, they were able to apply the stencils 48 hours later. There was no delamination or marring. Um, and the, the gloss uh, decreased 
Um, it is a moisture cure material, so the gloss decreases as it cures with atmospheric moisture, and um, all the gloss readings were in line um, 48 hours later. Slide 36. Okay, this is a, another demo that we performed in uh, March at Mar uh, the Marine Corps base at Camp Pendleton. Here we're painting a AH1Z Viper with the single component camouflage gray top coat. Um, again, the upper left-hand photo shows the uh, artisan spraying the material over the chromated primer. Um, what was unique about this demo and something that we uh, were interested to see was that um, could we indeed spray the single component top coat and then recover material and save it for future use? And so to paint this aircraft, um, we had two artisans spraying and they each used two gallons of material to spray each side of the aircraft. Um, after they were done spraying, um, the pressure pots were open. Uh, there was about uh, um, half a gallon or so, maybe a little bit less than half a gallon remaining. We took that material, uh, removed it from the hoppers and put it back into the original cans. And then we actually used that material the following day to stencil the aircraft. So if you look at the uh, the picture on the bottom left-hand side, the um, the stencil that says beware of blast, that is actually the lighter gray top coat that we recovered from the pressure pot that we then applied over the darker gray polysiloxane top coat um, that uh, was also supplied for the demo. Um, the picture, it looks a little bit pinkish, and that's just because of the way the photos got, photo is taken. But if you look at the um, uh, photo to the bottom right of that, um, which is the entire aircraft uh, one week later, um, you can see is that uh, there is uh, the, there is basically two colors on the aircraft. One is a, a medium gray and one is a bluer gray, which is located uh, on the top of the aircraft. And so, um, again, the takeaway is that we were able to um, recover this material and, and use it for future use without any sorts of issues. Um, again, um, you know, I mentioned uh, we were able to apply stencils uh, after 24 hours with, uh, without delamination or marring. Um, we recovered that material for future use for the stencils. Um, the, the gloss was in line after the few days of curing. And something else that I also want to mention is that during this demo is that we had uh, industrial hygiene monitoring um, when they were applying the polysiloxane top coat. And a few weeks later, when the lab data came back, um, as expected, it showed that there were zero isocyanates within the polysiloxane top coat. However, um, pulling reports from aircraft, from, from the same sorts of aircraft that are typically painted there, is that what we see is that um, the amount of, of HDI homopolymer isocyanate that is found um, when the artisans are spraying is typically um, about 0.581 uh, milligrams per meter cubed. And for reference, um, OSHA requires that on a permissible exposure level, so on an eight hour work day, is that the applicator should only be exposed to about 0.5 uh, milligrams per meter cubed of isocyanate. So even when they're painting one of these aircraft, which isn't a, a large aircraft, they're still uh, beyond the amount of isocyanates that they're actually supposed to be exposed to in, uh, within that eight hour day period. Okay, slide 37. Um, here, this is just a brief slide showing um, uh, that uh, we have uh, manufactured numerous gallons of these materials. Um, it's not meant to show that, uh, you know, 75 gallons or 25 gallons of material is any substantial quantity, um, but we are continually uh, manufacturing more of these, uh, more and more gallons of material to do demonstrations. And so the real takeaway from this slide is that from the camouflage or for camouflage single component polysiloxane top coats is that a variety of camouflage gray colors can be made, um, black can be made and so on. Uh, whereas with the two component top coat, which I'm showing on the, the bottom right, um, that is a, a gloss white product that is designed specifically for Navy ground support equipment. And essentially that's just showing that uh, 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 what the panel looks like after the top coat is applied. Slide 38. Okay, so um, some of our conclusions uh, about the polysiloxane top coats is that one, it's an environmentally friendly alternative to the isocyanate-based polyurethanes. The single component top coat is user-friendly. Again, there's no metering and mixing of components, so it's very easy to use. Um, and it's applicable whether you're uh, painting aircraft at depots 
or um, sailors are performing touch up and repair uh, in the field on ships. The single and two component top coats, um, we have demonstrated that they provide equivalent or even better laboratory performance compared to the two component polyurethanes. Uh, this is when they're tested to the uh, MILPERF 85285 or the uh, 32239 requirements. Um, and of course, while we're conducting the demos now over the next one to two year period, our goal is to show that the polysiloxane top coats provide equivalent, if not hopefully better performance than the polyurethanes that are in the field. And also for the two component gloss white top coat, um, we showed that it had uh, better performance on that MRTT after one year of uh, demonstration compared to the type two polyurethanes. And so uh, slide, the next slide, or slide 39. So um, that's all I have. Um, I wanna thank all of my co-performers um, on this project. Um, this is definitely a team effort. Um, so I have numerous co-performers that are located at uh, Nav Air Patuxent River, um, the Air Force Research Laboratory, and uh, also NCP Coatings, who is scaling up uh, this material for uh, demonstrations. Um, thank uh, Robin, I thank you again for funding this project, and I'll take any questions uh, that you have at this time. Great, thank you, Eric. And to our audience, just a reminder, you may submit questions by using the Q&A box on your screen. Um, Eric, we've received a number of questions for you, um, starting with a question from Navair in Jacksonville. Um, why did the standard control polyurethane coating system fail the required test, uh, flexibility testing? For the, I assume for the Air Force testing? Up to, for the bend and impact. It, it doesn't specify. Um, so it seems, it, it seems to be in all the work that we've done is that the polysiloxane top coat has a little bit better flexibility than the, than the polyurethane does. Um, I, I can't say the specific reason why it failed aside from, you know, it's, it didn't meet the flexibility requirement. Um, but all I can say is that the, over the, now this is over the magnesium rich primer. That's the one that the polysiloxane passed. Um, but in general, the polysiloxane has uh, slightly better um, flexibility than the polyurethanes. Um, and I, I think um, I think what might be unique about what we're seeing as the data is that oftentimes um, around around uh, rivets and some fasteners uh, over time is that we do see some cracking in the polyurethane systems. And so it just could be that um, when the polyurethane is over top of that primer, is that the you know you're not going to uh, obtain uh, nearly as high flexibility as if you are testing that system separate, or if you're testing the top kit separately. So um, the biggest takeaway is that you know using a using that magnesium rich primer, um, and we'll see if this bears out in the field uh, during field testing, is that we may see that we're not having as much cracking around uh, rivets and so on because the the polished siloxane is slightly more flexible. Great, thank you, Eric. This is a question from the Air Force. Can these top coats come? In a flat finish? Uh, they, they currently are flat, yes. Fantastic. Is a, the flat finish, it, the camouflage finish is the flat finish. Great. And another question from the Air Force, which, re, which reducing agent is used in the touch-up kit? Uh, that is, it's just a uh, methyl acetate reducer. So it's just a, Great, thank you. Um, okay. Um, a question from NASA. Is there any adhesion problem in applying the 1K polysiloxane coatings over an existing 2K polyurethane coating or 2K epoxy coating? No, we've actually, um, a research at, at researchers at the, the Naval Air Warfare Center, they have conducted that research already, um, and they've uh, done uh, compatibility testing with both. And we haven't seen any issues, uh, regardless if you apply the polysiloxane over the polyurethane or vice versa. Great, thank you. Uh, and this is a question from Raytheon. Um, what about the cost and availability of these top coats 
in the supply chain. Are you there yet? No, so to, to reach the supply chain and for the coatings to receive a national stock number, um, they first have to be qualified. So the point of this project, the point of this uh, ESTC pro ESTCP project, which is DEMVAL, right, is to, we wanna show that the polysiloxane top coat first performs um, as well, if not better than the polyurethanes. Um, and once we're beginning to see that on aircraft, then the coating manufacturer will do a full qualification um, to the the uh, the requirements. Um, once all those qualifications are are passed, then that that coating will be listed on the qualified product database. Then afterwards, as it begins to transition, then it would be assigned a national stock number to be able to be procured. Okay, great. Um, this is a question from Boeing Defense. Um, does the 2K polysiloxane material have similar sag resistance and dry time, at least better than the two-part polyurethane? Uh, I would say no. The, the two-component polysiloxane does not cure as fast as a single component, um, uh, and uh, it will not meet the same performance properties as the single component. So we found that um, the two components um, is really, it really does well to the, the, the 85285 type two requirements, but beyond that, it will not meet the requirements um, of, that are required for aircraft. Great. Uh, another question from the Air Force. How do 1K and 2K polysiloxane coatings withstand heat, specifically around the nacelle areas? Um, so the, there is a, um, a heat resistance test, uh, that is within, um, those mil specs that I've been mentioning, um, the, the polished oxygen top coats do meet that test. Um, I'm not, uh, uh, the individual would have to email me with, um, what the, the heat resistance requirements are that are needed for that specific application. So, um, be, you know, we have not performed testing beyond what is required by the mil specs. So if there is a significant um, uh, heat exposure, um, that, that's something that we would have to look at separately. Great, thank you. And then a question about um, life cycle um, assessments. This is another question from Raytheon. Have you conducted a life cycle assessment on the 1K top coat? compared to the isocyanate-based uh, top coat? Uh, not yet. And you have plans to do so, Eric? Yes, as, uh, as this project progresses, um, yes, that is something we, will, we plan to do as part of the project. Okay, um, great, thank you. Uh, and a question from Jensen Hughes. Does mill PRF uh, 81352 need to be revised to add a type for polysiloxane base before the touch-up kits can be qualified? Yes, um, that is something that uh, the stakeholders at uh, the Naval Air Warfare Center Aircraft Division, uh, they will be modifying um, that mil spec also to, I believe, to add an additional type that will be single component polysiloxane. Um, but yes, that, that needs to occur. Um, and th the mil spec for 85285 will need to be re revised also. And that is something that is planned because even that mil spec is specific for polyurethane chemistry. And so um, uh, it, it's still to be, yet to be determined whether that mil spec will become just a general um, coding chemistry or, um, you know, or, or we're not sure how we're going to do it yet, but, um, you know, there will have to be a new type or class or something that, um, that calls out uh, non-isocyanate or, or polysiloxane top kits. Thank you. Uh, and uh, this is a question from uh, Peacock Labs. Can the 1K top coat be put in a standard or into a standard aerosol can? Um, it all depends on the amount of moisture that is in the, the propellant that's being used. So that would be the biggest issue. So if, if the amount of moisture is low, then yes. But because it's a moisture cure product, 
if you're introducing a propellant that is just loaded with moisture, then um, then you're going to have issues because you're going to have uh, curing within the can. Great, thank you. Um, another question from Navair in Jacksonville. On slide 28, why did polyurethane perform better in corrosion testing than the polysiloxane? Um, so, again, um, I don't think we have an answer as to why. Um, I mean, these are, as I, as I stated, um, the degree of difference is very, very small. And so, um, it, it, you know, we're, we're splitting hairs here on is it, um, is it better or not. Um, but as to why that just very slight difference, uh, I, I don't think we have an answer for that yet. All right. Um, are there any issues uh, with applying the 1K polysiloxane top coat in uh, climates uh, with very low humidity? Yeah, so um, for some of the demonstrations that we've conducted, we have, um, or at least specifically one demonstration, we applied the top coat uh, where the humidity was down at 12%. Um, as you begin to starve the coating of humidity, um, does, does it begin to cure slower? Yes. And if you had zero humidity, um, would you have issues with the coating curing? Yes. Um, the ways to mitigate that, obviously, are you can add some humidity to the environment just by having some you know, buckets of water or something around the asset, or something that we've discussed. Um, if we know that, uh, say for instance, if someone wanted to apply this coating in the, in the desert, right, and there was near zero humidity, um, something that we can do is, is just add a reducer solvent that contained a little bit of moisture in it, and that would solve the issue. So there is a way to solve it. Um, if if someone would want to apply it at very very low humidities, but for all the demonstrations that we've done so far, um, and and uh, you know under most of the conditions where top coats are applied, um, we don't expect to have any issues with curing. All right, and one last quick question before we wrap up: Do these? This is a question from the Air Force. Do these coatings meet the reflectance requirements? outline for aircraft survivability? Uh, the reflectance, um, I would say from a, a yes, yes, that'd be the simplest answer is yes. <laughs> Great. And in closing, um, can you please uh, summarize the next steps in this really interesting work, Eric? So the next steps are, is, as I mentioned, we're continuing to paint uh, aircraft. Um, so the uh, the next steps are every six months we will go we will collect metrics from the different aircraft that were painted with the polysiloxane top coat um, so that'll include you know dry film thickness measurements color and gloss um, we'll check for any sorts of of uh, cracking or delamination and so on um, and we'll we plan to do that uh, hopefully out to a two-year period so that we have a you know we've collected sufficient data um, and then compare that to what we see with the polyurethane top coats that are found on aircraft. So that's that's Wonderful. really the plans for, for the next uh, year, um, year to two. Well, thank you for sharing this and thank you for a fantastic presentation. Uh, at this point, I would like to remind our audience that the next webinar in the Startup and ESCP webinar se series is in two weeks on Thursday, June 20th. Um, it will detail results from DOD-funded research on developing adaptation strategies to address climate change and uncertainty. Um, to register for this webinar and for future webinars, please visit our webinar webpage um, for a listing through the end of 2019. Before we conclude, I would like to remind you that both the audio and a copy of the presentation of today's session will be archived on our webinar webpage in case you would like to refer to them in the future. We would appreciate it at this point if you can please take a moment to complete the survey, very short survey, that will pop up on your screen at this time. This concludes today's webcast. Thank you so much for joining.
testing one, two, three. Anybody there? No, Robin, I'm still on. This is Eric. Okay. Hi, Eric. That went very well. I thought uh, lots of good questions, which is really nice. And uh, you know, I don't know if we had 170, but we certainly had a good uh, good crowd listening. So that went very well. Uh, good job. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Well, yeah. Thank you. And usually we have.